So after understanding how capitalism had took root and expanded in the United States, we're going to examine the capitalist triumvirate of John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and J.P. Morgan. Now, of the triumvirate, none fit Max Weber's Protestant ethic more perfectly than John D. Rockefeller Sr. Essentially, his father was a con man and a snake oil salesman who peddled miracle cures throughout the Northeast region, and he was often left alone with his mother, a woman who was a child of the burned-over district of the Second Great Awakening. So what Rockefeller's mother did was instill stern Baptist values in her son, such as the distaste for dancing and the theater, and a duty to not only attend church, but become very active in it. And Rockefeller, when he got wealthy enough, would eventually tithe $1 million annually to his church, and he even taught Sunday school. Now, in 1859, Edwin Drake struck oil near Titusville, Pennsylvania, and this set off a boom that was parallel to the California gold rush. Rockefeller himself didn't explicitly drill, but he entered the oil business as a refiner. And what that means is he supervised the separation of pure crude oil into usable components. He also built up his enterprise in Cleveland, which was the closest you know, big city to these oil fields. Efficiency was where he made his money. And he initially set out to use vertical integration to control the industry. And vertical integration is when you buy up the means of production of a particular industry. Uh, for example, Rockefeller bought his own pipes when plumbers worked for what he deemed excessive rates. And he had his own men construct barrels for transporting oil when the prices of the Coopers were too high. And he even perfected the number of soldier drops that were used to seal up barrels of oil. So as time goes on, Rockefeller will switch to horizontal integration to build up his empire. You know, he'd consolidate with rival companies by offering the previous owners shares of stock in Standard Oil, which is the name of his company. Now, in Rockefeller's words, he stated, we had to do it in self-defense. The oil business was in confusion and daily growing worse. Someone had to make a stand. To his end, instead of using the derogatory term trust to describe his business, this is what progressive politicians did, he referred to his model as cooperation. And when his company was eventually broken up in the early 1900s, Standard Oil controlled 90% of the market and kerosene prices fell to eight cents a gallon. So swallowing up his competitors was only one area of Rockefeller's life and business practices that came under scrutiny. You know, when he bought out a company, he continued to operate only the most up-to-date refineries, and he closed the ones that he thought were obsolete. So this meant that thousands could be without a job. But Rockefeller just, he considered it necessary to streamline production and get a quality product to consumers. The other area where he received criticism was his use of what were called railroad rebates. Basically, since Rockefeller was shipping large quantities of cargo, which were barrels of oil, all the time, he negotiated heavily discounted rates with the railroads because of the high volume of his shipments. It was seen as a win-win. The railroads are still going to make their money, and Rockefeller saved money with these rates. Now, the practice wasn't illegal when he first started it, but there were ethical questions that abounded. And he eventually lied under oath about continuing the practice, which is what people took issue with. And everything came out to the open when Standard Oil was busted in the early 1900s. Now, he was bothered by the assertion that he was successful due to the rebates. Objectively speaking, he was a heck of a businessman. And his influence is felt in multiple ways. In addition to his annual million-dollar tithe, he ended up donating nearly $540 million, million dollars in his life. Now for the first part of his life, there were mainly religious causes, but eventually he transitioned to what his son deemed safe donations like education and science. Among other things, he donated money to start Spelman College, an all-female historically black college. He helped start the University of Chicago. He funded efforts to eradicate hookworm in the South 
And the breakup of Standard Oil led to, you know, we can see on the chart, it led to some of the main companies that we know of today. You know, we have Exxon and then Mobil, which became Exxon Mobil. It gave us Chevron, Amoco, which was acquired by BP, and then eventually the Ohio Oil Company led to Marathon. So many of the gas companies we know of today had their roots in Standard Oil. The second is the philanthropist, Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie believed that a man's life could be divided into three stages. Stage one, you learn all you can. You know, Carnegie was a titan of industry, and it's sadly ironic that his father was a skilled craftsman, a weaver, and he was put out of business by steam engines. Carnegie immigrated to the U.S. with his family when he was 12, and they settled in Pennsylvania because his mother had a sister who was already there. Immediately, Carnegie went to work, first in a textile mill, then on the floor of a bobbin factory. And in the bobbin factory, he learned that the owner had shaky handwriting, so Carnegie demonstrated his penmanship, and he moved into office work. Then he got a job with a telegraph office, and he continued to expand his skill set. Then he was hired as the personal assistant to the superintendent of the Pennsylvania Railroad. He eventually took over his old boss's job and was able to take advantage of the oil boom in Pennsylvania when his railroads transported the barrels. So the first third of his life, he learned a vast array of skills. Phase two of one's life is earning as much as you can. When it became clear that Carnegie would earn far more as an investor than as a salaried employee, he identified steel as the industry that had the most promise. He first invested in a company that built bridges, but then he moved to just outright steel production. There was a massive demand for steel to replace the iron that was used to build the original railroads. He knew that Englishman Henry Bessemer had made steel production more efficient by blasting air through molten iron. And after visiting the factory in England, Carnegie sought to replicate the process in the US. He then devoted all of his energies to steel production. And he summed up his philosophy with the phrase, put all your eggs in one basket, and then watch that basket. His steel plants were located near his home, the railroads, and natural resources of Pittsburgh. And he was like Rockefeller in that he was ruthlessly efficient at determining how much each step in the process cost, and he knew how to minimize waste. His most famous blast furnace, Lucy, ended up churning out 642 tons of steel per week. And he also bought up all aspects of production. So he's a classic example of what we call vertical integration. He hired steel men, you know, men who knew the business and offered them shares in the company to keep them around. He really ran his business like a partnership instead of a corporation. Now, as part of what's called his gospel of wealth, you know, this is a, uh, an 1889 article that he wrote that summed up his life philosophy. The first third, a third of your life is learning. The second third is earning. Finally, you give it away. You donate it for the greater good. He believed that a man's wealth should go towards helping mankind. And he donated over 300 million in his life to various causes, mainly in education and the arts. And he even helped build what were called Carnegie Libraries. The image you're seeing here is the Carnegie Library that still stands in Superior, Wisconsin. You know, over 60 of these libraries were built right here in Wisconsin. So we have Rockefeller for the oil industry. We have Carnegie Steel. When it comes to finances, John Pierpont Morgan was born into a financial family. His grandpa purchased properties at discount rates following the Panic of 1837, and his father expanded into investing in commodities. His dad moved the family to London to be physically closer to the markets of Europe, and Morgan went to primary school in Switzerland and college in Germany. And this is where he displayed an aptitude for math. Now, Morgan never amassed the pure wealth of Rockefeller or Carnegie, but he's the most influential. Now, as an investor, Morgan wants to know who he's lending his money to. He began rescuing railroads after the Panic of 1873, when a lot of them are going belly up. 
His conditions were that one of his people would be placed on the board of directors and his company would get the majority share of the stock in the business. This formed what would become known as a holding company, where a company owns the majority of stock in another business, but doesn't produce the goods or services of said company. Morgan discovered that railroads had built too many lines to accommodate too little traffic, so he sought to restructure the railroads like banks and, like Rockefeller and Carnegie, make them more efficient. Now, this was a reason why Morgan was such a titan of the economy. As a member of the board of directors of major railroads, he knew more about railroads than any man in America, and since railroads touched all aspects of the American economy, he was privy to insider intelligence about the economy as a whole. When businesses were in conflict with one another, Morgan would mediate. Now, his claim to philanthropy was that he bailed out the U.S. twice. After the Panic of 1893, the gold reserves of the U.S. had dipped below $10 million, and there were $2 million being taken out every day. President Cleveland felt he needed to borrow gold to keep the nation's credit from defaulting, so he appealed to Morgan. Morgan delivered 3.5 million ounces of gold to the federal government, worth $65 million, and he did this in exchange for 30-year treasury bonds that would earn 4% interest over 30 years. So yeah, the guy personally benefited, but so did the nation. And he believed that his business would fail if the economy failed. Something similar happens again in 1907. A major company failed that would have sent ripple effects to the economy. So President Roosevelt immediately sent his treasury secretary to New York to tell Morgan he could have whatever he needed to keep the economy from tanking. He again used his company to bail America out, but he acknowledged that this was it. The economy was getting too big for him to handle by himself. So Rockefeller is oil, Carnegie is steel, Morgan is finance. The three of them collide in an acquisition that eventually becomes known as U.S. Steel. Now this is the most famous deal of J.P. Morgan's life. Charles Schwab was the president of Carnegie Steel and he wanted to cooperate rather than compete with large firms. Basically build a massive steel company that would have multiple interests allied under one firm. He hosted a dinner, he laid out his vision, and Morgan agreed with it. To merge multiple industries into one, it was clear that Andrew Carnegie needed to be bought out. And since he was spending more time on non-business ventures, it was ripe for the taking. Carnegie's wife really wanted him to retire as well, so she encouraged Schwab to broach the subject with Carnegie when he was golfing. Golf is Scotland's national sport, near and dear to his heart. Schwab let Carnegie win, so he kind of softened the deal. And when he broached the possibility of selling, Carnegie wrote down the price of $480 million on a napkin. Morgan was known not to counteroffer if he was given a fair price for what he really wanted. So he accepted, and the deal was made a few days later. Rockefeller, unfortunately, had iron mines that didn't belong to Carnegie, so that could have sullied the deal. So Morgan is encouraged to buy out Rockefeller's holdings in iron mines in the Mesabi range to ensure that the new steel trust would be secure. Now, Morgan and Rockefeller met in the house of Rockefeller's brother, and nothing happened. Eventually, Carnegie's former manager, Henry Clay Frick, brokered the deal between Morgan and Rockefeller's son, who negotiated. Morgan paid $90, um, $90 million for the iron mines and the ore boats that were concentrated in northern Minnesota, and U.S. Steel was formally announced. U.S. Steel was worth $1.4 billion. This is the nation's first billion-dollar corporation. The great irony of this is that Carnegie and Morgan didn't get along. Rockefeller and Carnegie outright hated each other, and it was publicly known that Rockefeller and Morgan disliked each other, but money talks. And in this case, everyone got something they wanted, and the triumvirate was able to make it work.